I'll start recording here. Uh, so this week's uh, One World Minds uh, seminar speaker is Roberto Oliveira. Uh, he got his PhD from the Courant Institute um, uh, in 2004. So he also spent some time in New York, I guess. Uh, after which uh, he did a postdoc at IBM uh, PJ Watson Research Center. And since then, he's been at uh, IMPA, uh, which I guess is, if I translate correctly, the Institute for Pure and Applied Math, but in Rio de Janeiro. Um, uh, he's been there uh, ever since and is currently a full professor there. So he's done a lot of um, excellent work in uh, probability and is uh, also the editor of several journals, including operations research. And uh, we're really happy to have him here uh, this week to tell us what he knows or some of what he knows about sample average approximation. So I'll turn things over to you now. Okay, thanks Mark for the very nice introduction and for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm gonna be talking about work, which is sort of, you know, pandemic work with uh, Philip, who's now at Purdue. It started out, as you can see from the archive uh, codes uh, a while ago, we submitted a paper, we got a, some reports back saying, add lots of examples and do all sorts of things. At the time, Philip was sort of between countries, so to speak. He, well, he since we wrote those uh, preprints, he moved to, yeah, he lived in, I guess he moved three or four times. And now, well, and now he's faculty at Purdue, so he sort of settled down. And, uh, but finally, the pandemic gave us a chance to go back to the original papers, uh, rewrite them, I mean, they were also sort of tough to read at the time. And we finally resubmitted them recently. So you can consider these as papers from last year, I guess. Um, and well, as I said, Philip, I guess at the time when we started this project, he was a PhD student at INPA. Then he went to uh, to Paris for a, for a postdoc in SAE, and then to Cambridge for a little bit, and he not, he's not Purdue. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about things that are important in optimization. Uh, I mean, the, this idea of simple average approximation is a very natural idea from a probability perspective. Uh, and it comes up when you have a problem that's an optimization problem where the objective function and the constraints may be given by expectations, right? So that's the optimization problem over here. The ideal optimization problem, that's a problem you'd like to solve, is you want to minimize a function little f of x, which is the expectation of f, capital F of x, and some random mask side. And then there are the constraints. As you can see, uh, there is a non-random constraint here, which is that x has to be locked to a certain set. And moreover, you have also constraints and expectation here. And I mean, this maybe doesn't read well. This is really little, sorry, little f i of x. And so the the, the constraint function also uh, give him an expectation. Little f i of x is just the expectation of capital F i of x in psi. Okay, so this is the ideal problem. What's the simple average approximation? Well, you, if, you, if you're given an IID sample from P, then it's pretty natural to replace the expectations by sample averages, which is what I've done here on the right-hand side. And uh, of course, we sort of expect uh, the SAA, right, the simple average approximation, to be similar to the ideal problem, just because for a large sample size, we expect the, the sample averages to be close to the expectations. But quantifying that is not obvious, as you can guess. I mean, it's not, there is no easy recipe that just tells you, I mean, how close these two things are for a given a large but finite sample size. And the, whole point of this talk is to give some information about how close these two problems are. And of course, okay, the general questions one would like to address is like, okay, uh, to what extent does the simple average approximation resemble the original problem? So let's say that this x hat of sub n is a solution to the simple average approximation. Is it true that it's a near minimizer for the original problem? So X is just a feasible set for the, for the ideal problem. And is it true that your SAA solution nearly achieves the optimal value of the objective function? 
is it also true that it's nearly feasible, right? So you have this feasible set, perhaps just because the, the feasible set of the SAA is random, right? Because it involves those simple averages. So can you ensure somehow that X hat uh, sub N, even though it might not be exactly feasible, is it nearly feasible for the original problem? And then if you want to have a uh, kind of finer information about uh, the solutions, maybe you want to look for things that say, well, X hat sub N minus X star is the solution to the ideal problem. And you want to know things about distributional limits of these things. So like I'm multiplying by square root of N because I expect maybe some sort of central limit theorem to hold, to be able to say that X hat sub N is equal to X star plus some Gaussian error of order one over square root of N. So from an asymptotic perspective, all of this has been done, though, I mean, it's not maybe completely over yet because, but, uh, but there are many, many nice results. I mean, I, I cite here a few papers by uh, uh, Alex Shapiro. And uh, as you can see, some of this work is already quite old, but very nice still. And, but the results are all asymptotic, right? So we're talking about letting the sample size go to infinity uh, so that we can prove things like the solution to the SAA almost surely converges to a solution of the original problem. We can prove uh, center limit theory, theorems describing fluctuations. Sometimes the limiting distributions are Gaussian, sometimes they're not Gaussian. Uh, one thing that's, well, it's not lacking from all papers and literature, but there's still kind of open questions, even, even in the asymptotic setting about like say rates of convergence and things like that is the case where the constraints of the SAA are random. So let me go back a little bit. So this set script I is just a set of indices indexing the constraints. So there should be an I belonging to script I here, right? So when the set script I is non-empty, means that some of the constraints of the SAA are random and uh, one find the exact effect of that is as far as I know, not fully over yet, not, not, not even the asymptotic set. But our goal today is not to consider the asymptotic setting, it's just to consider uh, non-asymptotics, right? And uh, basically, if you look at the literature, you see that the results are kind of lacking, especially if you consider all the settings where this SAA methodology has been deployed. And uh, the results are lacking in a few different ways. I mean, so there's a, there are these papers of Konkova with uh, different co-authors where they prove lots of results in the case where script i is equal to the empty set. So all the constraints of the SAA are exactly the constraints of the, the ideal problem. And the rates of convergence they get, they're like, well, you expect to get rates like one over square root of n and one over n, depending on what you're looking at. And they never get such rates. They always get rates that are sort of worse by a polynomial factor. And there's another paper a bit more recent by Valsangik, uh, Natalia Yuditsky, and Akadi Nemirovsky, where they prove things about the value of the program. So you can look at the infimum of the objective function in the ideal problem. You can look at the infimum of the objective function in the SAA, and you can compare the two. And they prove concentration results for these, but they require very strong assumptions, uh, like very light tails of the noise. I mean, you're going to get into that later, perhaps. Uh, and again, they only focusing on the value of the problem. So that which is not necessarily what you want to look at. So and I guess, I mean, I had to say big data at some point. Or, I mean, that's what we do to get a grant proposal approved in Brazil. Um, and uh, I mean, there's there's some motivation for considering considering a non syntactic problem. I mean, maybe if the sample size is large and the dimension of the problem is not too large, uh, maybe you're happy to use the asymptotic approximation and it's probably going to be sort of okay or pretty okay. But if you're looking at high dimensional settings where maybe the dimension of the space is comparable or much larger to the uh, than the sample size, right? Or either comparable to or much larger than the sample size then it's not clear that syntactic theory gets you anywhere, right? So for instance, if you want to apply the central limit theorem, which you have to, to do a syntactic theory, there are severe restrictions on how high the dimension can be. Well, I mean, the, the restrictions depend on the theorem a little bit. 
but uh, still, it's not clear whether the, the asymptotic theory is somehow applicable, even approximately. So doing non-asymptotic results seems relevant. And here's what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to explain our results on an asymptotic sample average approximation, and perhaps one point where this connects with the seminar, which is more in data science, right? But, but in some sense, uh, stochastic optimization is data science. Well, you get data, you want to make decisions based on that data, right? But there is, uh, as you probably know, the literature, say, on statistical learning uh, is, I mean, doesn't necessarily have such a a uh, large intersection with the literature on stochastic optimization. So in some sense, as you can see from this little drawing over here, uh, what we did was to, you know, to step on, to use a, a, a what's known in the statistical learning and, adapt, and some adaptation of that as a stepping stone to be able to reach uh, not only the low hanging fruit that perhaps had been uh, uh, picked before, but some somewhat higher hanging fruit. There is still kind of fruit, there's still fruit that's up there that's probably higher to have, harder to pick. Uh, may may I ask to ask a question? Sure. Yeah, um, uh, uh, this is a very trivial question, but in this analogy, what, what do you mean by the fruit? What, what are they? Right, so uh, uh, the low hanging fruit is saying, I can prove a quantitative rate of convergence uh, that describes the distance between the SAA and the and the, the ideal problem, and the rate is not too bad. It's something like one over n raised to some exponent, right? And but for that you need strong assumptions on the on the data. Say that that is sub Gaussian has very light tails and stuff like that. So we've been able to get better rates and somehow better dependence also. Oh. And another restriction that people make is to only consider, say, bounded feasible sets and things like that. Uh, so we've been able to get better bounds and make better use of the geometry and the problem. Sometimes it can consider unbounded feasible sets. Uh, we can allow for much heavier tails. Uh, we can get optimal rates or rates that, at least in the cases that we, we know what the optimal rates are, they coincide with, with what we get. Uh, but there, there are many settings where we don't know the results are optimal. So in that sense, we're still lacking. And I mean, in some, in some sense, that's due to the wide variety of problems that, that you know, fall under the header of stochastic optimization. Because I mean, it's hard to know in all cases what the optimal results would be. But uh, so that's, that's the idea. So before, I mean, the people before were sort of doing some quantitative results, which are not necessarily optimal, had very stronger assumptions, much stronger assumptions than what we need. So I get better rates with a weaker assumption. Any more questions before I continue? Okay. So before I actually uh, get going on this, I want to just show you uh, I mean, I said that somehow random constraints, right? When the SAA has constraints and expectation, that makes things different. And I want to explain uh, why that is in a very, very simple example, or two examples, rather. So here I have two optimization problems. They're completely, well, trivial in many ways, right? I, in this case, I guess I could write down the, the formula explicitly uh, for the solutions in both cases. I actually do that for the SAA. They are two strongly convex problems in the sense that, well, I mean, the, the function is trying to optimize quadratic in the decision variable. Here, the decision variable is one dimensional. Okay? And, uh, and strongly convex problems have any, many nice properties. I mean, people like Shara Mendelssohn and uh, Kuczynski and I guess Bartlett and Pancheco at some point have explored uh, uh, these properties to great effect and also give them liquid. But, many others that I'm forgetting to mention right now. They have, and so strongly convex is supposed to be nice, and it is nice. Uh, here I have two different problems. One, you can see that only has randomness. Well, I mean, it only has expectations in, in the objective function. The other one has a deterministic, or I mean, uh, not, uh, objective function that doesn't involve expectations. But the constraint is random. Well, random in the sense that I'm taking an, uh, an expectation, right? Once you take the expectation, that's just x squared or equal to one. But uh, 
the point is what happens if you do use this SAA methodology here, right? So I'm going to replace the expectations by sample averages. And then these problems turn out to be quite different. So the SAA for problem number one, remember, was uh, I, here the optimal solution was zero, right? So I have psi, which in a random variable would mean one. I'm subtracting one. So psi minus one has mean zero. And that's just this usual variance thing, right? So how do you minimize the expectation of X, capital X random variable minus little x? Well, choose little x to be the expectation. And uh, well, it turns out that the, okay, you wanna take X belonging to minus one, one. So for large N, this is X hat N is with high probability optimal solution. It satisfies the constraint. And then you have this phenomenon that if you look at the objective function, how close that is to the optimal value, uh, that is one, I mean, that's one over N in probability. Okay, you can actually write down, I mean, basically exactly the distribution that he gets. Now with the other problem, remember that the constraint involved an expectation. So now I have problem number two, I have a deterministic objective function and I have a random constraint. Here. And uh, it's clear, I mean, you can write down the solution explicitly again, it's just one over this average of exponential random variables that's over here you can get its asymptotic distribution. It's basically a normal random variable of mean one and, uh, and standard deviation uh, one over square root of n. And, and then you write down the distance between the, uh, the, the SAA solution, right? The, dif the, di the difference, sorry, the difference in objective function values of the SAA solution and of the ideal solution. And that's like one over square root of n. So you lose a rate, you lose your one over n rate, which is uh, the optimum rate of problem one, because problem two is different. It's a problem with uh, that in the SAA formulation has random constraints. So in some sense, what I'm telling you is that when your fluctuations, right, your randomness uh, lies not in the objective function, but it also lies in the constraints of the simple average approximation and your optimal point happens to be a boundary point, so that it's actually affected by the fluctuations of feasible such that can uh, lead to worse rates of conversions. Right, and I guess that's what I have on the next screen. That uh, I mean, so for people who are familiar with statistical learning theory, this is not really surprising because it's so simple, but perhaps it's something that it's not so easy to remember. I mean, usually strongly convex gives you fast rates, and here. And, and we see that it's not sufficient if we allow for fluctuations in the, the feasible set. Okay, so now I'm gonna use a uh, notation. I mean, a notation is gonna be a little bit different than before. Uh, so the ideal problem, I, I, okay, I'm gonna use this notation that some people love and some people hate, which is when I write something like this, see dot, it means that it's an expectation when I take psi to have measure to have distribution P. Right, I'm going to do this for any eyes. And, uh, and you see that, well, the objective function, I mean, just for convenience, I'm going to call it F notch, right? So capital F is just as always the function that includes randomness. And little f is the function that uh, when you average out the, the randomness. So this is the same problem as before. But now I'm going to make some assumptions on the randomness in the problem. And I'm going to start with a simple case, okay? Now, the simple case that has been considered before in the literature, except that I'm going to make weaker distributional assumptions on the noise, you might say. So a very standard setting under which this ideal problem is analyzed is, uh, is this. So first of all, remember that we have a set of constraints that are fixed, and that's this set over here, Why? I mean, that's just a set that say like, um, the unit volume, which is also going to show up in the, the SAA. And assumption number one in many papers is that this set is compact. Assumption number two is that these functions, capital F I of X and Psi, they're sort of stochastically Lipschitz, right? Meaning they're Lipschitz in X with a constant that depends on Psi. 
that's just a way of saying, okay, that excludes lots of things, of course, excludes anything that's discontinuous in X, almost surely. Uh, but uh, that's a standard, uh, a standard general assumption that you make to be able to, to make progress on this problem. And, but not only that, people tend to assume something about this Lipschitz constant. So what, I'm, what I want to assume, and perhaps is a bit of a kind of, you know, one of those things that you look at them and you don't make sense out of them immediately. But basically uh, what I'm assuming here is a condition on the pth moment of these Lipschitz, well, the two pth moments of the, the, the Lipschitz constant, right? So the Lipschitz constant is random. And, uh, and I'm making assumptions that have to deal with uh, two p moments for some p larger than one or larger than two, sorry. So with four, fourth or higher moments. So just to make, uh, to contrast this with the, the standard literature, uh, usually what people do is they make assumptions on L sub i that implies that infinitely many moment exist, moments exist, like sub Gaussian, sub exponential or something like that. And uh, okay, so this is what I said before, right? So that uh, Lipschitz type assumptions are common in the literature. Uh, people uh, usually make infinitely many moment assumptions, like sub Gaussian assumptions, sub exponential assumptions. We make finite moment assumptions. And under such assumptions, the only other work that I know of that sort of general and broad works with this kind of assumption does not get the optimal convergence rates in this general setting, which would be something like one over square root of n. Rather, they get that multiplied by some uh, n to the theta, by some polynomial factor, right? Okay, so what do we get? So this is not our main result, but it's sort of interesting just to see that by doing a few changes to, I mean, using the right techniques, so to speak, right, for concentration and stuff, we can, uh, we can do better. So, now I'm going to consider, uh, in order to be able to speak about the SAA, I mean, the SAA, remember that uh, the feasible set also changes, right? So before I had constraints saying that the expectation had to be less than or equal to zero. When I move to the SAA world, I have the same expectations of the sample averages. But it's clear that a point in this random feasible set does not need to be feasible for the ideal problem. What I'll be able to show is something like uh, it's feasible, uh, it's nearly feasible, in the sense that it satisfies all constraints up to some eta, right? Up to little error eta. So the, the, this fee, there's a large feasible set I'm going to call x sub eta. So the original feasible set is x, and x sub eta is a large feasible set where I allow constraints to be violated by at most eta. Now there's a bunch of numbers here, perhaps gap you don't need to worry too much about right now. Um, uh, that's just saying how much the value, right, the, the minimum of the problem changes when you enlarge the feasible set. But these two parameters I need to, to look at now, right, remember that we're thinking that Y is compact, and it's a, sub, maybe I should have said, well, it's a subset of symbolic space, I guess. No, I mean, that's sort of relevant. I mean, it's, the point is that dimension won't matter. But then I have the diameter of Y is going to come into play. And also this other quantity, the generic chaining functional of Y, which one of, well, one of the two things about generic chaining is possible. One is that you may have heard about it before, in which case you see a strange formula, formula and maybe it'll ring a bell, or maybe you haven't seen it before. And in that case, I'm gonna show you something that looks very mysterious. I'm gonna try to make a little bit of sense out of it. So, okay, what is this generic chaining function? That's what I'm going to describe next. So generic chaining, so to speak, is, uh, is a way of quantifying how discretizable, how easily discretizable Y is. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you have these sets A sub I, and I mean, okay, A zero, A sub zero is just one element. A sub i has at most two to the two to the i elements, and that's in some sense for convenience, but it's nice that it's there, but don't, shouldn't think too much about the size. And now you're looking, okay, you pick an admissible sequence and you look at this quantity between curly brackets, right, here and here. 
And this is saying you take a point in Y and you see that for each set capital A sub I, you're gonna look at the closest point to Y, right? And you compute that distance. Well, multiply by a factor that's growing with Y. So if this sum is small, it means, or if it's finite, if it's not too big, it means that for a large enough Y, these points A sub I are very close uh, to, uh, sorry, for large enough indices I, or maybe I should have called these J because otherwise I have I and Y. So let me call these J. Um, for a large enough J, the closest point to Y, in the set A sub J is pretty close to Y. And it gets closer and closer, right? Because these factors of two to the J over two are growing. So you can think that each A sub I is a, oh, each A sub J, I don't know, is a discretization of your space Y. And this gamma two measures something about the quality of these, these discretizations, how quickly you're, uh, you know, these sets are kind of converging to arbitrary points in the space Y. And uh, this quantity, well, I mean, this version was introduced by Michel Talagant in uh, the control of sub Gaussian, well, Gaussian empirical processes of the Y. He proved some very deep theorems on the subject. And uh, we're basically going to use his work. But uh, again, for people who are familiar with this, we're going to use his work in a setting where it's not supposed to apply, where you don't have real sub Gaussian assumptions. And here's the SAA, right? So the SAA, you replace uh, the averages with respect to P, which we're writing like this. Right, so dot. And you replace these averages with sample averages, just, just replacing um, the measure P by the empirical measure of the sample. And then you have these quantities here, at R uh, sub N hat of T, well, it depends on the gamma two functional, it depends on the diameter, there's a T here. And then you have this other error quantity, which depends on R sub N, and depends also on how much the optimal value of the problem changes when you kind of perturb the feasible set by minus R N, right? So just, just to remind you quickly, right? Remember that you have this new feasible set here, eta, eta could be negative or positive. Right, if it's negative, you get a smaller feasible set. If it's positive, you get uh, a larger feasible set. And this is saying there's a price to be paid if the feasible set sort of shrinks because of noise. Roberto? And okay, yes? Quick question. In the constraints, um, the distribution with respect to which you take the expectation needs to be the same as in the objective or could you allow the distributions to be different you could allow them to be different but at this level of generality somehow it doesn't make a difference you can like you can think that all of your randomness in your problems contained in one huge vector containing you know each part of this vector corresponds to either the objective function or one of the constraints so you can uh so really you should Think of P as the joint probability distribution of all the randomness that's involved in your problem somehow. So, I mean, so it, the framework is general enough to, to encompass different kinds of randomness acting on different constraints. But presumably, yeah. cases where uh, they're all identical versus they're decoupled might in impact the result. That's a very good point. So in here, we're taking a very kind of pessimistic approach in some sense, which is we are not, uh, we are not assuming, for instance, that they're, they're uh, we are, we're not making any assumptions, we're right? sort of going your worst case of, uh, on how these uh, constraints flight trade. So it could be that in some sense correlation, in some cases correlation might help, right? But because uh, in some sense it might be a hindrance because they all move a lot in the same direction. And it's a bad direction somehow. Uh, we, because it's very hard to formulate a result that's general about this, we we didn't think about that too much. We just said let's do a worst case result. But you're right. Yeah, that's a very good point. That in, yeah, in no, principle, it's not thinking, only yeah. Yeah, no, I was just thinking about all of the applications these days on adversarial training, where 
you have your standard stochastic objective based on the distribution of the data, but then you now have adversarial attacks that corrupt your data and you want to have a guarantee uh, on performance with respect to those other serial attacks. So the constraints would be exactly with respect to a slightly different distribution. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, one thing that perhaps I should mention now, I mean, I was going to say at the end regardless, but is that, uh, well, for instance, in this first theorem, we're working with a very general framework. And it's clear that any specific case that we've been able to think about uh there are more kind of you know there are more facts about the problem that you can add that would probably lead you to even faster rates of convergence in some cases so we're being very pessimistic because we're very general uh i don't think the results can be improved much at this level of generality but you're right that if you look at specific problems say like adversarial attacks then probably you can look at the fine structure of the problem and gain something from that so in some sense, perhaps the main part of what we've done is to kind of provide some of the tools or need, especially when we move to the next part, which we're going to assume convexity, right? Which is a very strong assumption, which is not applicable to deep nets, perhaps. Uh, but it's one case where we can at least provide a toolbox and say, okay, there are many things you can do. In this general setting, we've done what we think is the best, but in any more specific setting, you can probably do better with these same tools. But yeah, but that's a very good point. I mean, it's good that you asked this question. Thank you. Any more questions? So, okay, the theorem with all these uh, symbols and uh, you know, things that are hard to read is that the probability of ABC is uh, the joint, the probability of ABC jointly occurring is. Uh, it's pretty large. So it's uh, one minus e to the minus t. Remember that t was a parameter that showed up here. So e to the minus t is basically the probability of error you're willing to allow, except that this is extra term that depends on the p, right? Remember that p was something about our moment assumptions. And, uh, and basically what this is saying is that, okay, uh, if n is large, uh, the higher P is, up to some point anyway, uh, the more constraints you can allow for. And again, this is sort of, uh, I guess that's very much related to the, I mean, this term somehow comes from the fact that we are doing a worst case analysis of the constraints, you're making no assumptions on their joint distribution or anything like that. So we have to pay a price for that, which um, for people who know such things, it's just a union power. Okay, but what does the theorem show? It, show? it shows that, first of all, the solution to the SAA is nearly feasible, right? It violates the constraints by, uh, at most, this value r hat sub n of t. Oops. Uh, and then the objective value of the, uh, if you compute the objective function on x of hat n, that's close to being optimal. So it is distance two times r hat n t plus a gap that comes from the fluctuations of the feasible set. And then you also have the distance between the value. So this is the optimal value of the SAA, and this is the optimal value of the ideal problem. And you can bound their distance. So yeah, no constraints violated by too much by the optimal solution of the SAA. Uh, the optimal solution of the SAA is nearly optimal for the original problem, for the ideal problem, and the values of the two problems are close. And uh, so the main point is that basically when, when number one there holds, if the number of constraints is less than, let's say, n raised to p over two, then the main error in the theorem has a sub-Gaussian aspect to it. So it, it's controlled by this gamma two generic chaining functional, plus a term that describes random, random fluctuations multiplied by the diameter. And the fluctuations of the feasible set are also controlled by something that's at most the term above. And this looks like a sub-Gaussian result, even though we made finite moment assumptions. And perhaps I can say a few words for the specialists on how we achieve that. 
And basically the idea is that this simple result, I mean, as I said, we're gonna talk about more interesting things later. This simple result is a uniform convergence result. So I, we just look at the difference, take every constraint and also the objective function and look, well, it, there is its ideal version where you're averaging noise over P and the sample average uh, approximate, uh, the sample average version, right? So the ideal versus SAA version. If you can control the distance of, between these two things uniformly over the set Y, remember, Y is a set of fixed constraints, which you're assuming to be compact. If you can control this distance, then basically all the properties that I showed you follow. Okay. And the key to proving that is a self-normalization concentration inequality, which basically sh uh, shows this. So again, right? So I, I'm being a bit technical here. It's, this is for people who know this sort of physical process uh, stuff. But you're looking here at sample mean minus true expectation uniformly over points X in your feasible set. You want to look at that. And this result is telling you that you can control the increments of this process, right? You can control the changes when you change X or X prime in a way that's sub-Gaussian, that behaves like a Gaussian random variable. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to divide here, if you like, by this term. So you divide by the average of the Lipschitz function plus the, well, the mean of the Lipschitz function squared plus the sample mean of the Lipschitz function squared. And then you have this sort of sub-Gaussian control. The moments of P hat n minus P of F or whatever, they're controlled uh, basically by the distance between X and X prime after you divide by the Lipschitz function. This is a self-normalization inequality because you notice that I took a denominator here that's random. So basically this splits the, the task of controlling the empirical process to two parts. There's a sort of Gaussian part, the part that comes from this, and there's another part that comes from controlling the, the Lipschitz constants. But I'm not gonna say much more about this because it gets technical. So, but yeah, this is basically saying what I, what I just said, you control uh, the sub Gaussian in part in a way, and then you use polynomial tail bounds for, for the Lipschitz constants. So yeah, let me skip this and go. So the main point of what I showed you is just to show that uh, in all settings that, well, in the main settings that had been considered from a non-asymptotic perspective recently, we can get better convergence rates with uh, weaker moment assumptions. Uh, so we can get rates that are optimal, the degree of generality you were looking at. And uh, we can do that even though we allow for random constraints, which these papers do not allow. And even though we take heavy tailed ones, right? We only make finite moment assumptions in the data. Right, but there's a drawback to these results, which I mean, it's also a drawback to previous results in the literature, which is the assumption that we need a compact or at the very least a bounded set Y. So we have these random or these constraints given expectations, but we also have an, an additional constraint that the decision variable X lies in a set Y, and this set has to be compact or bounded if you're in finite dimension. So our next step is to show how in a convex problem, you can uh, get away uh, with something much better. And that this is really where uh, we made the most use of ideas from statistical learning theory. So the convex setting is where, uh, well, why the fixed constraint is convex, all the functions f sub y are convex in x. And we're gonna make an extra assumption, which is like a stability assumption, which is this. So remember, uh, so I have here my feasible set X and I have a smaller feasible set or a smaller set, which is X minus eta star. And uh, this is simply, I'm instead of having here that, uh, that expectation of uh, capital F Y of X and Xi is less than zero, required this to be less than minus eta star, right? So it's a smaller set. And this later condition tells me that it's just saying that the set is non-empty, right? So there are points in here. You can, uh, in other words, 
the, the I mean, this is what's called an interior point condition. You have feasible points that satisfy all the constraints with some slack. I mean, they satisfy the constraints uh, and and with strict inequality. Okay. Now this, uh, we're gonna need some new notation, but it's supposed to be simple. I mean, even though maybe it doesn't look quite look that way from the drawing. Um, now I'm gonna talk about points. I mean, this is very simple. It's just points that are nearly optimal, uh, right? So the value of the objective function at X is nearly optimal for the original, for the ideal problem. It's optimal up to epsilon. And if you look at the constraints, they're violated by at most eta. So if X is the green set in the drawing, X minus zeta, right? So you, you, you're requiring the constraint, uh, you're looking at interior points. So that's the red set. Uh, the blue set is X plus zeta. So you're allowing constraints to be violated a little bit. And then you have, uh, if you look at regions one and two in the graph, those are supposed to uh, uh, be the set X star epsilon eta. So the set of points that are nearly optimal, so there is some sense close to the optimal point of the SAA, this is X star over there. And they don't violate constraints by too much. So there, I mean, the reason why this, these sets pop up in our analysis is that uh, for, many, uh, for many problems, I mean, convex or not, it, if you're looking at points that are close to being optimal, even if you allow constraints to be valid a little bit. If, if you look at these points, I mean, th th these might form a bounded set. Say, say that the objective function grows quadratically, right? So it might be that this set is bounded because simply if you're looking at a nearly optimal point, it cannot be too far away from the optimal. But uh, uh, the whole feasible set is not bounded. So, and we're going to see that we can somehow in the convex setting restrict our analysis to these local sets where where nearly optimal constraints are nearly uh, not violated. And we're also going to see that with this interior point slater condition, we can make sure that these sets, I mean, they have a well controlled geometry or well behaved geometry. And basically, the idea is then is going to be that we have this localization phenomenon whereby we can say, uh, well, let me look at it in a negative way. So let's say that the SAA is bad. Somehow it doesn't approximate well the structure of the, right, the solutions to the SAA are not close to being solutions or to being feasible for the ideal problem. Uh, localization means that if that's the case, if you have these, this bad event, it might be, in, uh, it, sorry, it must be that something bad happens very close to the optimum of the SAA. I mean, it's not, you don't need uniform convergence where you prove that uh, the SAA uh, uh, is well behaved over the entire feasible set. You only need to worry about what happens in the neighborhood of the optimal of the SAA. So that's the essence of this localization phenomenon. It's been exploited by many different authors and especially in the convex setting, uh, two papers by Shaha Mendelssohn, and then, well, he worked on, on that with many, uh, with some collaborators afterwards. He showed the kind of the, the power of this, in that if you use localization, you can make weaker moment assumptions, uh, and you can, uh, you don't need to ask that the feasible set is bounded. But he did that in a setting that's like SAA, but only, uh, there's only expectation an expectation the objective function. You don't allow the constraints to be random somehow. And now I'm going to give a very brief sketch. I think uh, maybe I should ask, how much time do I have? You if have, anybody knows. You have, uh, you have another 10, 15 minutes if you want. Okay, so then I have more time than this thinking. Good. But uh, yeah, I'll try not to use it all. Leave time for questions. Um, so, okay, so I described the localization phenomenon that somehow using convexity is going to allow us to do an analysis in the neighborhood. But, I mean, when I use this word neighborhood, I need to be a bit more precise. But in favorable cases, uh, you can restrict the analysis of the problem to a neighborhood of the optimal point. And uh, 
but that starts from results that do not involve probability at all. That are just about take a, a convex optimization problem, look at a perturbed version of it, and uh, when is it the case that the solutions to the perturbed problem are near solutions or nearly optimal, nearly feasible for the ideal problem? Or if you like, when is it the case that the solutions to the perturbed problem are not good solution or neither or they are not nearly optimal or they are not nearly feasible for the ideal problem right so that's the bad event down there well it's not an event because as i said this is a deterministic result so bad for us means that you take the optimal solution of the perturbed problem and it doesn't belong to the set x star epsilon eta and here's what that means either the value of the objective function, which should be F naught here, sorry. I know I forgot this. Uh, either the value of the objective function at the solution of the perturbed problem is too big, right? It's more than epsilon away from the optimal or the ideal problem. Or this should be X hat. Or there is a constraint that's violated by too much. Right? So that event says that. Right. So the good event would be the solution of the perturbed problem is both nearly optimal for the ideal problem and nearly feasible. So bad means that it's either not nearly optimal or not nearly feasible. And uh, and everything I wrote here, everything is convex. So sets are convex, functions are convex. Uh, and then we have this lemma, which in a way is a kind of a generalization of things that people have done in statistical learning theory. And uh, it starts from, right, so it starts from a condition that's a sort of later condition saying this feasible set has an interior point. And it tells you basic, basically that uh, if the bad event happens, if this bad situation happens, it can be for one of three reasons. One, is that okay so let me try to draw this here well there's a drawing in the next screen so maybe i'll leave it uh, for that um either something happens at the bad in the interior point either the constraint right the constraint function by the the perturbation does not approximate well the constraint function for the ideal problem at the interior point or uh, the, there is a boundary point, right? A point that's in this small neighborhood of nearly optimal, nearly feasible points. Uh, and there's a boundary point of that guy where the, the constraint of the perturbation does not approximate well the constraint of the original problem. Or there is a point that's nearly optimal, nearly feasible, where somehow the value of the objective function uh, is not close, right? So the value of the objective function at X for the perturbed problem is not close to the value of the objective function at X for the ideal problem. And I mean, it's actually a bit more complicated because I have these differences and these differences turn out to be crucial for getting faster rates, but that's basically what I'm saying. Okay, so if you have the bad situation, it must be because something bad happens at this specific point, the interior point, or something bad happens in the sense that the perturbation is not a good approximation to the ideal problem in this small set, right? Either the constraints are not right or the objective function is not right, but everything is restricted to the small set. And I mean, the drawing is here, but maybe I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that a uh, I could spend some time to explain and then you just say, oh, of course, that's just convexity, right? But uh, it would take a while to explain. I mean, there, there's some sort of sketch here, but uh, I don't think it's worth spending too much time. It's, I mean, as many other proofs involving convexity, it boils down to the fact that, uh, well, the interior point is good because it's a good approximation to the optimal solution to the original problem under our assumptions. Uh, you're assuming that the solution to the perturbed problem is bad. So you find a line segment between these two points and there's a point on this line segment that somehow you're representative for things going all right. And it's close to the 
uh, the, the original feasible set. And it's close to the original optimum of the ideal problem. That's basically it. And I'm going to skip this. So, yeah, and that's a, the upshot of the lemma is that under this Slater interior point condition, we can say that if the optimal solution of the perturbation is bad, it means that either the objective function or the, the, the constraint functions of the perturbed problem do not approximate well the objective function or the constraint functions of the ideal problem. And now I want to control the geometry of the set just to be able to quantify things. So what, what am I doing here? So I'm looking at something like, um, perhaps I want to add, uh, I want to add a, a page here and draw a little bit. So I have this, uh, this is a feasible set for the ideal problem. Let's say that my optimum lies close to the boundary. That's the optimum, the ideal problem. I, and then I have this region of guys that are nearly optimal and nearly feasible. And I'm, I'm sort of assuming that's a small set in my drawer. Right? It doesn't make a difference for the theory, but you're going to understand it. And uh, I want to understand how large this set can be in terms of, I mean, how complicated it can be, basically in terms of this piece here. And uh, my result's going to be that if I have an interior point in this set, so if, if you like, this point here belongs to nearly optimal points, which are feasible with some slack. So if you have this point, then you can guarantee that this set here is contained in the authentic copy of the smaller set that I, that I drew here. So it's a bit, so this is like a, a blow up of the black set that, uh, well, maybe I should use a different color here because black is, oops. Uh, yeah, here, this brown set, and I have this larger set, which is like a blow up of the brown set, which contains the black set. So sorry, there are lots of colors and lots of concepts in this talk, but hopefully you get the idea. Is that even though you're relaxing the constraints a little bit to be in the set, right? It's basically the subset, it's up to a, a, a enlarging, right? A homothetic uh, transformation. This set here is contained in X and not only that, it's contained this corner of X where the nearly optimal solutions are. And that's more or less the, uh, the content of this lemma. So that uh, if you look at nearly optimal solutions with some slack in the, the constraints, as long as you have an interior point, uh, then uh, this set here is contained in a pathetic copy of this guy, which is entirely within the feasible set. And this means two things. It means, first of all, then when you relax the constraints, right, you allow them to be violated by eta, well, it could be that the set somehow you go from having a bounded set to having an unbounded set or a very large set, and this is saying this is not true, right, so that the diameter, for instance, is going to only going to increase by a factor of two at most, and also this gamma two functional that described, right, this generic chaining functional is also going to increase by at most two. So you don't get hurt by allowing constraints to be perturbed, and that's very important for us. Because in the SAA, when you have random constraints, the, the feasible set is certainly not going to be uh, the original feasible set. And still, you want to say that's somehow controlled. And well, there's a proof sketch, but again, it doesn't matter too much, I guess. Well, I mean, I, I like it, but I don't think it makes sense to spend too much time on this. The point of the drawing, perhaps, is just to say you use very, a very simple con uh, convexity argument. And you show that if you have an interior point and you have a point in this larger set, the midpoint between the two is a feasible set for the original problem. 
with nearly optimal uh, objective function value. And then you're done, basically. Okay. So what's our current state of affairs? So it's saying, I have a bad thing that I wouldn't want to happen. Again, what is that, right? So it's saying that the SAA solution either uh, violates a constraint by too much, or it's far from being optimal for, uh, uh, for the original or the ideal problem. And uh, the bad situation uh, in this perturbation localization lemma, we saw that a bad situation, uh, if it happens, it's due to the SA, the sample average approximation being bad at some point inside the small set. Sorry. So bad in the sense that either the constraints are not well approximated in the SAA or the objective is not well approximated in the SAA. So that's the, uh, that if things are to be bad, that has to happen in the small set. And this, well, Robinson style lemma. So Robinson proved the related lemma in 74. So uh, this Robinson style lemma is just saying that this set is indeed small as long as this guy is small, right? So this is the set of feasible points that are nearly optimal. This is a set of uh, nearly feasible guys that are, that are nearly optimal. And this is saying that the set that nearly feasible is contained in feasible up to a factor of two, if you like. And then this allows us to, to, to state a theorem. I mean, and that's our preliminary theorem. And it's hard to read. The, the actual theorem is a bit worse. But so let me stick with the preliminary theorem a little bit. So just say, uh, you assume convexity of everything. You assume the starts later condition, meaning that there is an interior, uh, interior feasible point. And then for uh, for epsilon that's not too small, uh, you you define these quantities, right? So okay, you also need to make this sort of Lipschitz assumption. Remember, we made this, these stochastic Lipschitz assumptions, things like this. Uh, you make these assumptions. But now you don't need these assumptions over the whole space. You just need them in the small set around the optimum. Well, I mean, in this hopefully small set around the optimum. Right? It's not always small, but it tends to be small in most interesting problems. And then you have these error terms. And notice that they all depend only on the feasible set around the optimum, so on nearly optimal solutions. And then under certain condition of this term that it's not too large, then you know that the, the solution to the SAA is gonna be nearly optimal and nearly feasible. And you can also argue that the value of the SAA, sorry, the value of the SAA, which is here, is close to the value of the ideal problem. And so again, to, to repeat, right? So uh, basically I'm saying that if locally around the optimal point for the ideal problem, I have interior points and I have a well-behaved geometry, then I can prove that the results I want happen with high probability. Now, what else? So, I mean, this is not the end result because uh, if you want to get the optimal result, you need to have a way of choosing all of these parameters in an optimal fashion, right? So notice that when you apply this theorem, you have this parameter eta, and it could be that you have this later condition, not only for a single eta, but for many values of eta. And then you have to take epsilon greater than something, and you have uh, this eta. Yeah, this eta shouldn't be here, sorry. And then you have, uh, yeah, these parameters are fighting with each other, and you want to choose them the optimal way. So I'm not going to describe exactly how you do it. Again, it's one of those things that if you haven't seen before, it would take me a while to explain. But 
basically there's a way for choosing all of these parameters as small as possible, in some sense, and that's the choice you want to make. And then you get some explicit bounds. Uh, and they come from some sort of, uh, well, for people who have seen uh, Sean Mendelson's papers, they come from some sort of fixed point argument. But it's just saying that, okay, you have a bunch of parameters, you have to choose them optimally if you want to make uh, uh, as good, uh, as strong a use of these bounds as you can. So rather than spend more time in that, let me just quickly talk about examples. Uh, one is metric projection, where you, this is just a problem. You have a feasible set and you want to find the closest point to x naught in the feasible set. And uh, the point is that when you apply the first theorem, you get bounds that are not known before, even for y bounded. Okay. And even for uh, uh, if you don't mind having things that are dimensionally dependent, that depend on the dimension of the problem here. When you apply theorem two, you get better bounds in some settings, which are optimal, for instance, when you're looking, you have your feasible set X and you're looking at the closest point to X naught and X point happens to lie on the boundary. This is an interesting case because uh, the fluctuations here are gonna come from the fact that the, the feasible set is random in the SAA, right? That's just like one of those examples that I showed you a long time ago. And as one last, I mean, as two last examples, I mean, there are all the things that we can look at, like uh, the lasso, we can recover some old results and actually improve of them uh, in the heavy tailed setting. Uh, we can look at some portfolio optimization problems where you put a, a risk constraint, which is describes bas basically this tells you how much you're going to lose your portfolio under a uh, uh, an event of small probability p, right? That's the expected loss conditionally on an event of small probability p, right? And you want to make sure that for a p that's not so small, this prob this expected loss is not so big, right? So maybe your portfolio is good. It doesn't lose much on average. You even wins you some money on average, but there's an event of chance 5% where it loses you $2 million and you want to avoid this sort of situation. And the point is that if you look and uh, sorry, if you look at what happens in this problem, we can look at some toy models of what would be correlated assets in the market. So you can invest in stock, say, but some of this stock is very correlated. It gives you a large gain on average, but there is a correlated risk factor that makes them all of a sudden be small together. So you probably want to avoid those guys, right? And uh, when you have this sort of setting, we can show that the that the convergence rates for the SAA in this problem, they're actually faster than what you'd think for the dimension, simply because uh, it's like the SAA is going to avoid investing in those uh, talks with a correlated risk factor. I mean, that's, of course, kind of a nice and colorful way of describing a mathematical result. This is not necessarily the right modeling for, for stocks, right? Because we're making assumption on ID data, you never get that in the market. But still, it's sort of an interesting mathematical statement. And yeah, hopefully having convinced you that this stuff in spite of being technical is nevertheless interesting, I'll finish and thank you for your attention. All right, thanks a lot for, uh, for the excellent talk. Um, I will open up the floor now to any questions that anybody hasn't already asked during the presentation.